without further ado, we're going to talk about the metamatters. We're going to talk about one with, uh, with uh, Peter Hutton and Chattery. So please welcome the man himself, John Dykes. Thank you very much, Jasper. You always mention that one. That was a great way to start our working relationship. It's not about me. There you go, you've heard it for the first time ever uh, from me uh, today, guys. No, it's fantastic to have the microphone on again. It's wonderful to uh, be looking, albeit at some very distant cameras. Uh, it's all fantastic to be in front of an audience and so many familiar faces here. Wonderful. Thanks for having the opportunity to be part of something that is so um, life-affirming. And there's an affirmation here today that sports matters. And, you know, it, it's also an opportunity to silence that horrible, nagging, niggling voice that has been getting into our head over the last 18 months, questioning our assumptions and values about the value of sport, whether it be competitive, participatory, sports broadcast values. Okay, God sports matters. I'm here today. We have already heard from a panel and from, from the data from Mike there that's going to bear this one out. We've got two great keynote conversations coming along over the next 35 minutes or so in which we're going to hear from two absolute giants in their respective industries. I'm really privileged to be talking to these guys today. Two titans, if you will, in their fields. If you like, we're going to be hearing from an alpha and a meta. We've got one guy who has been the CEO of three of the bigger sports broadcast entities in the world during the course of his career. We've got another guy who heads up uh, one of the world's top ten sports properties in terms of viewership and engagement. This is going to be absolutely huge. We've got two back-to-back -back keynote conversations and then a bit of a quick fire, 15 minutes or so of questions for them. So let me just sit down and get ready for the first of these. We're actually going to be opening up our first uh, VTL, virtual travel lane uh, of the session here at Sports Matters. And we're going to bring you a man who has served as a, a colleague, a boss, and a, a mentor and inspiration to many of you in this room and of course even more uh, further beyond this room as well. He only works for a company and in a role that sees him um, operate Facebook, Instagram, Oculus and WhatsApp. He is the Global Director of Sports for Meta and he is Peter Hutton joining us from California right now. Peter, great to have you with us. How are you? I'm good, and I'd like to claim the one big other claim to fame he didn't mention, which was I commentated on the next year of the beach volleyball after you in Hong Kong. Great to have you with us. We've got to sort one thing out here, right? Okay, so I've got the name away, Meta. Now, you know, let's go English here, shall we? There you are in Palo Alto or wherever you are in California. And when you sit in that meeting, do you go all English and say, I say, chaps, are we talking about Meta? Yeah? Or do you sort of soften it and go, you know, go Meta? My biggest problem is still the football soccer thing, but you know, I'll, I'll go with whatever people are going with in the room. <laughs> Let's get into this straight away, because I've mentioned that already once, and I think we have to start off here by saying that so many people in this room and beyond, Peter, are going to be having these images still in their mind of that incredible Mark Zuckerberg uh, Connect keynote. Um, amongst other matters, in the middle of it all, he went off and, you know, in his avatar mode and got into a bit of gnarly surfing action. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who are going to be sitting here saying, okay, Peter Hutton is with us here. He's going to be talking about how sports matters to meta, which means there's going to be all kinds of exciting stuff that is going to be about VR and it's going to be about tech. So what have you got for us? And maybe more crucially, when? Yeah, I think the when is as important as the what, because I think we've got a clear vision. And the great thing about what Zuck was able to do was that he really built sports into that vision of what Meta is going to be and how we see the growth of the metaverse. Whether it be him surfing, whether it be him fencing, that idea that sport is something that's essentially social. It's something that's better watched together or played together. And it's that sense of presence that is key to what we believe that Meta's future is. And that brings together a lot of different aspects. You can probably see it clearest at the moment in things like fitness apps, where people are increasingly already competing against others within a fitness app world. And that's an easy representation of what Meta is. But the, the best story for me in terms of where we're going to is something that I saw as a trial with Sky Sports in the UK. And we watched a Premier League game in VR and for many of the engineers it was a pretty basic experience. They were like, oh, there's not many unique cameras, there's not much special about it. But for me it was really interesting because I put the headset on 
I started watching the game. And if you imagine there's like a drop down big screen in the same way as a basketball court has a drop down big screen. So you saw the best of the TV coverage, but then you look down and you saw the whole 22 players, you understood far more tactically about what was going on. And then with a wave of your hands, you brought on graphics and you chose those graphics. And it was that sense of multiple elements of choice for the viewer, but then sat with other avatars that you had chosen to watch the game with. And you really want to watch the game with people that share your experience of the game. You don't want to watch it with like, you know, the, the man behind you who shouts in the, and gets everything wrong. You want to watch it with your friends. You want to share it with your fans. And as a result, that for me gave me a sort of real clear roadmap in that this is where we could be going. You could experience sport in a better way. And it would give you that sense of presence and bring you a lot of the things about being in the stadium that I really miss by watching TV on the screen at home. You know, Peter, we've, we've done this for so many years now. And, um, you know, when, when we think about what we want from, let's, you know, we're talking about football here in particular, our football experience. In a moment, I want to talk to you a little bit about community and engagement and so forth. But just because you brought that up there, you know, at the heart of everything that, that we ever do when we develop any football um, ideas and properties these days is this interaction element. Is it, is it fair to say that that's almost the holy grail? That, that, that ultimately where as a fan you want to arrive at, that has to be where you want to be, whether it started with putting a microphone on, on a player in a live sporting context or, or putting cameras where you could on referees, that's where we're going ultimately, isn't it? I think it's just a natural sports viewing experience now. You know, I watched a, a Derby County game at four o'clock in the morning this morning, uh, California time, and I was chatting with people, you know, whether it be Paul Hextall in Singapore from Vice, who's another Derby fan, or other Derby fans who are in, in the UK watching it. It was a shared watching experience. And I think, you know, something like WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups are such a natural part of being a sports fan in that you want that community around you. You want to share the highs and particularly the lows in the case of Derby. And just, it's just a natural way of getting more out of sport. And as a result, you know, that's the direction that we're clearly focusing on. And as one of our former colleagues, I think, uh, said recently, if there's any way you guys can come up with a virtual method for getting those points back for Derby County, then that would be uh, all the better, wouldn't it? Uh, let's go on to what I said I was going to talk about. And can you tell us a bit about the, uh, the broader range of meta businesses in terms of what you're doing in, in the sports space when it comes to messaging, engagement, and, and I think the really critical part of all this one, which is, which is communities and groups? Yeah, I think we look at the sports business and what we can bring to it across the family of apps as in four different buckets. And when we say family of apps, you know, we're talking about Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, Oculus. We're looking at all the different ways that you can communicate with your um, community around a sports event. And those are really fundamentally about audience development, first and foremost. How do you build a better audience? How do you find your next fan? And when you listen to Mike Rag's numbers, it's clear that you're not necessarily going to build your audience and find your next fan by traditional linear methods. And therefore, social media is a really important part of that journey. And that can be through groups. It can be through fantasy activities. It could just be just through stories or augmented reality or reels. And then the second element is sponsorship, where, again, when you look at that measurement of sponsorship, you look at the targeting of sponsorship. Social media really plays a major role within that. Um, and then you'd move on to things like commerce and conversion, because commerce is going to be a bigger and bigger part. Um, and the idea that you can live a moment and then buy something associated with that moment is, I think, a really natural experience. And the growth of NFTs, I think, is something that is clearly linked to that. And then finally, you've got the actual use of social media. And this is not just our platforms, but also YouTube and TikTok to drive clear monetization. Um, and I think increasingly you're seeing a growth line of revenue coming out of those areas. So that's four key businesses for us, mm. audience development, sponsorship, commerce and conversion, ad funded monetization. And then hopefully we can also have a social impact on top of that. Peter, you know, there was a time when, you know, had I sat down and had a conversation with you sometime in the past few years, people would have assumed that it probably would have turned out to be a conversation largely dominated by, by sports broadcast rights. But 
we're sitting here and this isn't the case. Our broad remit really here is to talk both about how sport matters to, to Meta, but also how, how I think sport matters to Asia and how, how Asia matters to Meta as well. So if we can just move this onto the Asian sporting landscape, and this takes us into, you know, quite frankly, an uncomfortable position, you know, an area for, for some of us, because we have seen tumultuous change. We've seen disappointing change to an extent uh, in recent times. You and I both know ESPN Star Sports. Jasper referenced it earlier on, and we, we've seen the end of an era there. But we've also seen new beginnings, and, and, and this conference, as much as anything, is about uh, green shoots and new beginnings. Give me your take on, 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 on the landscape here, what has been and what is coming. I think, first of all, you know, it was very sad for all of us to see what happened to ESPN Star as it was, or Prime as it started out with ESPN. Um, you know, for me personally, if you um, accept, I'll, I'll wander off into a personal story. You know, that it was part of my life for like 20 years, in that when I moved to India in 94, the only way I could watch any football was on Prime Sports. The only problem was the only league it would show was the Chinese league. And, and then I gradually ended up selling more and more stuff to both ESPN and to um, Star Sports as it became. And, you know, you, we helped sort of drive the two companies together in that as IMG, we, we achieved the miracle of getting cricket rights to $1 million a day in 1996 um, with the Sahara Cup. And that famously forced the two companies to talk to each other. Um, then the third way that I got involved in that story was when we launched 10 Sports, because when ESPN Star merged, it was the perception that, okay, we're going to dominate the sports broadcasting business now, which of course stimulated competition in every other market. And 10 Sports, uh, which we helped set up in, uh, in Dubai and aiming at India, was part of that competition. And then the fourth way, when I actually came back and then worked with you at the SPN Star and we launched Fox Sports. Um, you know, so it was a huge part of my life for 20 years. And I think a huge influence on the way that people have um, got to know sports brands across Asia, you know, great talents involved, people particularly behind the screen, the talents on screen were quite good, but the talents behind the screen, people like Hugh Bevan, Jim Ribbons, you know, huge influences in the way that Asian broadcast has grown up. Um, mm. So, you know, very sad to see that end in terms of, in one way, but clearly the legacy of those people and the talent that were brought together continues and you meet them in every sort of sphere of the business. Um, and it's fascinating now to see so many new businesses grow up and the rights fracture and sports brands think in a more holistic way about how do we use our rights to build our long-term business as opposed to just necessarily one rights check. Yeah, so, so tell me what you see happening. That, you know, specific to this region, we're seeing new players, we're seeing new platforms, we're seeing people trying to find their way, but enough about my life. Um, you, you know, t tell us what you see happening in a broad sense and how all this fits together. Um, because, you know, there are amazing deals being done for the Premier League, for example, in America and Australia by the looks of things, but we're seeing a bit of fragmentation here in Asia. Just quickly, we have just under three minutes. What's the way ahead for us in the short term? I think fragmentation is the key word. You know, you look at a deal like the US deal, it's a huge number, you know, which is three times the current rights fee driven by the promise of DTH subscriptions. But at the same time, the number of DTH subscriptions that deal will drive will in no way pay for the rights fee. So as a result, it's a long-term bet by NBC saying, we want to control this umbrella of rights and we'll use it in multiple different ways as we progress. So that's got to be a combination of linear broadcasting. And in some markets, as Mike Raud said, linear broadcasting is doing very well. Free-to-air broadcasting is doing really well in, in some areas. But you'll also see more and more integration of the revenue lines. That might be selling merchandise. That might be betting. That might be the multiple ways that sports can drive commerce. And I see that being more and more built into the live sports experience. Yeah, and that's fantastic. You know, Peter, in a short while, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we'll have a few questions in, in a little while with our, with our next guest, and I'll bring you back in for that. But this has been a difficult time. How, how are you bearing up just now in terms of learnings from the last 18 months, two years? What's the key takeaway for you? I think one of the learnings, and, and maybe it's about the last 18 months, but maybe it's also about working at a company like Meta is that they run like a huge amount of training schemes, you know, in a way that I've never experienced any of the media companies that I've been through. And I'm really grateful for them because 
it's made me a lot more purposeful about the way I manage, the way I look at relationships, and the way that I see the business affecting individuals. Um, and that sense of the need to really check in with one-on-ones, you know, to really care about someone individually because you're not going to see them. You're not going to pick up on as many signs as you would do physically. So I think it's changed the way that people manage. And I think it's changed people's priorities as well. You know, and I think one of the benefits is that people aren't flying half around the world for one meeting because they know there is a better way of doing this. And if VR can be part of that, that's also a great legacy of Meta in that maybe our meetings can happen in that way rather than have some huge ecological footprint. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you come face to face with Jasper's avatar, which I need to have a word with him about at some point. Uh, but uh, Peter, thanks very much. If you could just spare a little bit more of your time, your Sunday evening time in California in a short while, we'll get you back in about 15 minutes or so for those quick fire questions. But ladies and gentlemen, all the way from California, Meadows, Peter Hutton, thank you.